uh, other words of wisdom? Um, yeah, no, I just want to echo what um, Dr. Freudenreich just said. Thank you um, so much for coming. I know we know you all could do something else with your Saturday mornings, and so it's so nice to see familiar faces and, and new faces uh, coming to this program. You know, it's something I look forward to every year. Um, and, uh, you know, I think our, our theme today is, um, it's, I was just looking at the, the title, out, Outside the Box, yeah, I like that, um, in psychosis treatment, uh, towards stage-based and symptom-focused care. So, you know, the, I think what we're going to talk about is, um, you know, some real innovations uh, that are going on in the area of uh, psychosis treatment. You know, the, the, the field is really moving towards um, you know, a more sophisticated, more nuanced kind of approach, you know, with the idea that, you know, there isn't a, like, one-size-fits-all kind of uh, 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 sort of uh, treatment approach. Um, and, um, you know, we're moving in, in some ways towards the way a lot of other areas of medicine treat patients, you know, more individualized, stage-based, symptom-focused. Um, so we're excited to to talk to you about that, and uh, we really look forward to um, spending the day with you. So thanks for coming. So uh, we'll start with uh, Dr. Holt, uh, who's going to speak on, uh, well, I don't see the title now, on resilience, right, and yeah. prevention. <laughs> uh, she's, as I said, she's uh, my co-director, or we are co-directors. Are you my co-director? <laughs> no, really, you're my co-director. Doesn't co -director. sound right, does it? Yeah. <laughs> so, some, somehow. <laughs> Uh, she's an associate professor of psychiatry at Harvard, uh, and uh, you can read, you know, you have a summary of what, what, what we do. Uh, she is the director of the Emotion and Social Neuroscience Laboratory at MGH, and also the director of the Resilience Program, so, so, so highly qualified to talk about an, an area of, of great interest in, uh, in the field of, of psychiatry and, and the field of uh, schizophrenia. So, Daphne? Whoops. Okay. Um, sorry. I don't know if the pointer works, but it's okay. All right. All right. Um, well, as I've just said, um, you know, uh, what we wanted to talk about a fair amount today are, are, is this idea of stage-based care. Um, so I'm sort of starting you off um, by showing you um, what we now know about the stages of psychotic illness. Um, that essentially uh, there's been a lot of interest in recent years about this kind of long prodromal phase um, where you know there are these these very early uh, non-specific symptoms that um, can emerge as early as you know middle school or you know sometimes even earlier of uh, you know perceptual aberrations cognitive sort of slightly you know uh, you know unusual experiences cognitive impairment or you know biases you know things that are very subtle that are very non-specific no one would expect anyone you know to be able to pick up on those things and you know, a very large percentage of the time, those things are completely benign and transient. Um, but in some cases, there's something of a progression, as you can see here. So that very early stage, uh, you know, some people call that the period of the basic symptom. You know, basic symptoms is what those, those uh, perceptual changes and cognitive abnormalities are called. And then in some and a small percentage of people at that stage, uh, there's a progression to more uh, positive symptoms, but, you know, attenuated positive symptoms that, again, most of the time, the vast majority of the time, uh, don't get worse, you know, and are transient. And then in, a, uh, you know, something like, uh, you know, 25 to 30 percent of people who are at this kind of late at-risk stage, they pr uh, progress to having a full-blown first episode. Um, so what people have really come to, you know, sort of uh, agree on is that these different stages of illness, and then, you know, obviously there are further stages, so after the first episode, 
Um, there's the kind of early recovery stage, um, and then the you know kind of maintenance stage. You know, once people have recovered, um, you know, relapse prevention becomes the focus. Uh, sort of return to you know. Uh, uh, having a good quality of life, that, that kind of thing. Um, so what people have come to agree on is that these different stages kind of have different uh, emphases in terms of you know, what we want to focus on in terms of the interventions. Um, so um, you know, there's been a lot of attention recently, uh, uh, a lot of focus on sort of comprehensive, intensive treatment of the first episode. And you'll be hearing more about that from uh, uh, our, uh, the speaker after me about advances in thinking about you know, what uh, produces really much better outcomes uh, if we really provide sort of comprehensive care at that stage. Um, and then, as I said, then the, you know, during the, the kind of more sort of chronic phase or you know, later recovery phases, uh, we focus more on il illness management, relapse prevention, um, you know, overall health, recovery goals. But there's been a kind of a new kind of focus on the stages that precede illness, which, as I said, is more complicated because they're very hard. It's very hard to identify people who are uh, likely to develop uh, psychotic illness. But we're getting a lot better at it, actually. And so we really want to join the ranks of the rest of medicine, um, you know, where prevention and, you know, sort of early detection has really been uh, so much the focus and has been so successful, you know, say in the areas of, of cardiology, in oncology, um, you know, different um, all, almost all fields of medicine have now really uh, made huge strides in terms of reducing incidence of disease, reducing morbidity, uh, mortality by focusing on early stages. Um, so having uh, you know, uh, a sort of a treatment approach for each of these different stages is really um, what the field is aspiring uh, to. So, you know, my question on the top of the slide there, when and who should we treat? Obviously, um, all of the above, you know, um, but we need to be very thoughtful about, you know, what, what kind of treatment is most appropriate and is going to produce the best um, sort of gains, the, the, the best outcomes. So just to, um, uh, you know, kind of convince you that this kind of early intervention is worthwhile, um, I'll, I'll just uh, mention one or two studies um, that really have sort of driven this home. So this was a kind of a landmark study, um, you know, done in sort of the uh, late 90s, early 2000s um, in uh, Scandinavia. And they, they did a kind of an, an intervention that would be a little bit difficult to do in the U.S., although right now there's a study that's trying to replicate the study. But essentially what they did was they had the, you know, different sort of, uh, um, you know, healthcare sectors, catchment areas, whatever you want to call them, uh, where they uh, decided that in some of those areas, two of those areas, they would have a very intensive public education campaign about the signs of psychosis. So that was the early detection program that they developed. And then in some other healthcare sectors, they didn't have that program. So those were the sort of the control groups. And they found, amazingly, huge effects on duration of untreated psychosis, so DUP. So they reduced DUP in those areas that had the education campaigns dramatically. You can see um, that they, in the early detection areas, the uh, duration of untreated psychosis, so the amount of time people had psychotic symptoms before they got treatment, went down to five weeks. And in the non-early uh, detection areas, it was you know, 16 weeks, which is actually still a lot better than what we see in this country, um, sadly. Um, and you know what's what's been found in this study, and they have done follow-ups, you know, time and time again. First at the time of onset, and then three months later, one year later, two years later, five years later, that those that uh, were in the um, early detection areas just have had much better um, courses of illness, less 
um, less, uh, lower burden of negative symptoms, uh, less suicidality, um, better treatment response, um, many things. Uh, and, and this is just a, well, not so recent, but f uh, this, I think, was the last follow-up they did five years later where they showed that, I mean, you can just see how flat these lines are. They just stayed, the, the group that um, was in the, the ED group had lower negative symptoms, lower depression, depression uh, and uh, 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 better cognition um, throughout the entire follow-up period. And then another form of early intervention at an even earlier stage um, has been conducted um, in Europe. I mean, again, the, these are you know, difficult trials to do, and, and we've had less of those in the US, uh, where people have focused on, uh, so, so that study I just told you about, the TIPS study, focused on the first episode, um, sort of trying to get people in quicker while they were already psychotic, but the treatments that people received in that study were the same in both groups. It was just that one group received them sooner um, than the other. Um, so in this study, people uh, were in the prodromal phase, the very early prodromal phase, uh, where there are you know, these basic symptoms, these very nonspecific symptoms. And the, as I said before, the likelihood that uh, these um, people with basic symptoms develop schizophrenia is actually not very high. So this is the kind of study that needs to be done in uh, quite a large number of people. But they found when d doing this very intensive kind of intervention where there was individual treatment, family treatment, um, a whole variety of services offered, that they could still reduce the onset of schizophrenia, reduce the number of people who converted. Um, and so um, there have been, this is just one example of a few studies that have been done. This is the only one that I'm aware of that has done uh, this kind of interventions in the early prodrom prodromal phase. But th that there, there is some evidence um, that intervening at this stage actually can change the course of illness and even perhaps prevent it. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I just want to talk a little bit about, like, what is it that would be helpful to do at this early stage if we can reliably identify people who are at risk, which, you know, is still an open question. We're still, you know, that's another piece of it that I'm not going to talk about so much today. You know, how do we best identify the at-risk uh, people? Right now, mostly what we're doing is measuring symptoms by just asking people, you know, what their symptoms are, which is, you know, not the best method. And ultimately, hopefully, we can use more objective methods, like, you know, maybe even neuroimaging or, or something along those lines, you know, brain scans to, to really, um, you know, identify people without having to rely on what they say. Um, but, you know, the, the symptoms are actually not so bad in some ways, and, and a lot of the problem is that we just don't get to these people and we don't have a chance to ask them about their symptoms. Um, so, but I think what I'm going to focus on now is just, uh, you know, what is it that we could do to reduce the risk of illness um, or improve outcomes in those who become ill? So one, th one topic that's been very popular uh, that people have been thinking about a lot is the, the idea of resilience. You know, um, you probably hear that word, you know, it's sort of, um, you know, thrown around a lot and, and it's sometimes not that clear what it means. Um, does it mean, um, you know, just intrinsic traits that people have that don't change or does it have to do with, you know, where you were born and what kind of resources you have and, and things like that. And, you know, it turns out it's, it's all of those things. Um, but, um, you know, so it's been defined in various ways, such as, you know, the capacity of an individual to avoid negative social, psychological, and biological consequences of stress. That's, that's, that's one way to think about it. So it's the ability to kind of bounce back from adversity, essentially, um, to, to handle stress, which we all have in our lives. Some people are just more vulnerable to it. Now, I, I think I prefer, prefer this definition, um, which is, you know, a more dynamic one, the, the idea that there isn't like a fixed capacity to withstand stress, that this is something that can change over time. So, you know, the, 
the, the capacity of a dynamic system to adapt successfully to disturbances that threaten you know, system function, viability, or development is a kind of more updated uh, definition. Um, but this is sort of the, the simplest version, the ability to rebound from adversity. Um, but I guess you, you can see that you know, my opinion and, and I think the, the way the field has kind of um, uh, interpreted recent data is, is to conclude that it's actually not a static quality, that resilience levels can change to some extent, that there's some intrinsic factors, but there are you know, modifiable factors. Um, so just to, to remind you that, you know, that there actually are um, sort of environmental factors, you know, stressors um, in, in the lives of people who are at risk for psychosis that impact the risk of psychosis. And obviously, everyone is different. You know, every person who develops a psychotic illness has a different story and you know, these risks may or may not have played a role. You know, some, some people have perhaps more genetic burden in terms of risk than others. Um, but it's been shown definitively that environmental factors have a big role. So, you know, uh, adverse, you know, sort of traumatic events during, in utero, you know, during the mother's pregnancy, infections, nutritional deficiencies, you know, trauma. Um, and then it's been recently shown that childhood, um, uh, you know, tr stress, essentially, uh, childhood trauma, bullying, um, it, it is a risk factor for schizophrenia. Um, and then th there's some interesting ones, like living in a city, you know, increases your risk for developing schizophrenia, just because of the kind of the stresses of living in a city, um, it, you know, adds stress to the brain. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this, more about this, this idea that minority status, this was a, just a correlation that people found that if you're an immigrant or minority, uh, your likelihood of uh, developing uh, schizophrenia is, is a little bit elevated. And it turns out it has nothing to do with um, any, being a member of any particular group, you know, race, ethnicity. It has nothing to do with socioeconomic status. It really has to do with a, an aspect of being a minority, which is being under more stress, you know, being a, experiencing more more social stress, which I'll I'll talk about in a minute, related to discrimination and and that kind of thing, and then of course cannabis use, which I won't talk about much today, but that is a a well established uh, risk factor, especially heavy use before the age of fourteen. So this is just to. Uh, you know, describe one example of what, I, what I'm talking about um, in relation to how social stress increases risk for psychosis. And one kind of extreme version of that is uh, the social stress related to, to being discriminated against. So it's been well established, again, by a number of studies conducted um, in Europe and, you know, looking at immigrants from Australia, or um, from uh, you know, the, the Middle East or from Africa, um, that minority status increases the risk of developing schizophrenia several fo fold. Um, and um, the, here's one example of a study that showed this that I thought was quite interesting, you know, um, conducted in the Netherlands. So in the Netherlands, uh, you know, they have excellent records and, and they can look at things like this. So they found that uh, you know, people who uh, had immigrated from Morocco, which in that happens to be a group that's, that's um, you know, discriminated against a fair amount, unfortunately, in, in the Netherlands, uh, had a very high uh, rate of um, uh, increased um, risk for developing schizophrenia, while Turkish immigrants there who are, for whatever reason, treated a little bit better, even though from a socioeconomic perspective, they're not different, these, these two uh, groups of, of immigrants, um, they had a much lower risk. Um, and, uh, you know, the, there are some other groups that had kind of a medium level risk. Um, but they found in this study that this actually, this level of risk correlated with the amount of discrimination that was reported. And they had, you know, very sort of objective per, uh, records of sort of discrimination rates for these groups. Um, so all of these kind of environmental effects that I've mentioned, I mean, not all environmental effects that affect risk for schizophrenia fall under this category, but the ones that I'm talking about right now generally fit under this, this category of, of being related to increased social stress. 
And people have shown using brain imaging that social stress affects the brain in a way that is, makes it harder for it to function. Um, this is, you know, was a, a study where they uh, studied Turkish immigrants to Germany um, and found uh, that when they were stressed in the MRI scanner, so they were experienced a, a, a stressful situation in the scanner where they, they criticized people and, and made them perform a task that was you know, difficult to perform. Um, that in that in that case, their their brain was overreactive, and the degree to which their brain was overreactive correlated with with discrimination, uh, the amount of discrimination that those people had experienced. Um, so, um, I think though the idea that resilience is modifiable is something that we're now understanding, and that you know. Everyone experiences some degree of social stress or you know stress in their lives, even if you you know don't happen to be um, you know a member of a group that's discriminated against, or you haven't experienced bullying, or um, you know or you didn't have a sort of a, you know you didn't experience abuse in your childhood. Those are all extreme examples. We all experience some degree of that uh, sort of a form of social stress. You know, feeling excluded. Um, you know, trying to sort of live up to certain expectations. You know, there, there are all kinds of, you know, sort of variations on that continuum. Um, and so everyone, you know, has to have some kind of mechanisms or, or skills to sort of cope with these kinds of stressful situations. Um, and, you know, the, it, it's been shown that if we kind of look at those skills and we try and increase them, that we may be able to actually increase resilience and protect uh, people a little bit from these, the, the effects of this kind of stress. So, so, you know, the model is really that for people who are vulnerable to developing a major psychiatric illness, major mental illness, such as schizophrenia, there's some degree of genetic vulnerability. I mean, that's been shown that that schizophrenia has something like between a 50 to 80 percent heritability rate. So, you know, some of it is just purely genetic, the risk. Um, and this, this risk is manifested by, um, in, you know, certain tendencies in how the brain works, you know, how the brain functions, the structure of the brain, which is manifested in certain kinds of, you know, skills or cognitive abilities or, or social kind of capacities. Um, and so having that vulnerability and then, you know, being hit with a lot of stress then could trigger the onset of an illness. You know, that's kind of the way we're thinking about it. But perhaps if we tip the scales the other way, if we build resilience in some way, um, some of those kind of vulnerabilities can be uh, counteracted by some, some improved resilience. So, you know, where do we start is kind of an overwhelming question. I mean, if you read about r resilience, you'll, you'll see, like, you know, there, it's, it's, uh, it's a big literature and there's a lot of ideas about it, you know, what's most important for resilience and all that kind of thing. But um, I think that um, one thing that we know, as I just said, is that um, there's a particular form of stress kind of social stress that is particularly kind of toxic and, and difficult for, for people to manage, for the brain to kind of metabolize, so to speak. Um, and we know that uh, people who are at risk for schizophrenia as well as people who have the illness have deficits in, in, in social perception and in social, what we call social cognition. Um, and when people have the illness, social cognition or their ability to understand uh, and we'll talk more about what this is to understand social cues and, and, and exhibit sort of uh, social behaviors that uh, fall into uh, the norms that we're aware of, uh, that those uh, sort of abnormalities or deficits is a very strong predictor of functioning in schizophrenia. And as I mentioned, these de deficits are seen in people at risk and, and actually predict the development of schizophrenia or, you know, are uh, kind of extra risk factors. So social cognition, as I mentioned, are really the cognitive and neural processes that underlie our ability to interact effectively with others. 
And some of the components that we study in, the, in, you know, in research studies include facial affect recognition, so the ability to understand um, you know, what, what somebody's conveying with their, their expressions. You know, is this person angry? Are they disappointed? Are they being sarcastic? Are they being uh, mistrustful? Are they you know, kind of excited? Um, and then there's something called self or other, and other awareness, which I'll talk about more, which is a little bit of a kind of a, a large uh, category of things that's a little bit poorly defined in some ways. Um, but essentially, you know, being kind of comfortable with yourself, aware of yourself and what's happening in your body and in your mind, and then being aware of, you know, other people and the fact that they have a mind just like you, you know, all those kinds of kind of uh, capacities um, are really, really important in terms of being able to be effective uh, socially and, and, um, and also withstand social stress. And then theory of mind is, is kind of a, a research term for this idea of being able to be aware of the mental states of others, and we also call it mentalization. So those are just some examples. It's uh, by no means comprehensive. Um, you know, is, there are many other kinds of forms of social cognition, but these are some that we study a fair amount. And you know, as I, as I mentioned before, we know that in schizophrenia, these functions are affected. And we actually know from brain imaging studies that the parts of the brain that are important for uh, producing these functions are affected. So for example, this is just one example of, of uh, many, many studies that have been done in people with schizophrenia showing that the parts of the brain, so there's this part of the brain that's in the middle, um, that um, is very important for, for social perception, for the self and other awareness. It's, it's called the default network. And you can see that in the, in the sort of the control subjects, the people who are not, um, who do not have uh, schizophrenia or any other psychiatric illness, there's this pattern of connection between different parts of the default network. In people with schizophrenia, that connection, those connections are lost to some extent. These are maps of, uh, sort of average maps of a whole bunch of people who have uh, schizophrenia and then an average map of people without the illness. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit now about a study that actually is ongoing. I'm, it's sort of uh, very early days for this study, but I, I just am sort of excited to talk about it, so I thought I would talk about it today, even though we've just really begun this study, and I'll just show you some very preliminary data from it, um, where uh, we are essentially uh, testing out an intervention for people with very mild risk factors for um, psychotic illness who are, you know, really in that very, very early stage that I showed you, um, maybe even before that stage. Um, so, and, and in the, this study, uh, you know, we're testing out this intervention in college students, actually, and we're following them over time. And so this, I'll tell you more about this intervention, but essentially the intervention is focused on improving social cognition and helping people withstand social stress. Um, so you know, the rationale uh, for doing this in college students is that we know that the peak of onset of psychotic disorders is during late adolescence and young adulthood, including the ages where people uh, attend college. And you know, perhaps many of you know people who develop psychotic illness during college. I mean, that's something that we see very, very often. Um, now, um, the continuum model of psychosis, uh, I won't go into that in too much detail, but this is also a kind of a popular kind of new way of thinking about psychosis, that it's not just there are people who have the illness and there are people who don't, but there are people actually kind of all, this, all the way in between. There are people with kind of mild symptoms and more you know, severe symptoms, but don't necessarily have what we consider to be an illness. But that perhaps all of these people have a kind of related problem, and that, that there are at least some people in these very kind of mild stages who have the biology and some of the same issues that people have who have the, the 
the full-blown illness. And you know, this is a very helpful kind of conceptual, conceptual model because it helps us think about these people as people who need help, even though maybe they don't think they need help, and maybe they're actually even functioning, you know, going to college. But they have some stuff going on that maybe we should address, you know, some, some mild symptoms and some problems with their social cognition. And then you probably, you may or may not be aware that college mental health in general is a, is a little bit in a crisis. I don't know if, if you know about that, but it's just, there's an incredible amount of sort of unmet need on college campuses. You know, people have um, all kinds of, there's a huge percentage of kids who have illnesses already who are not getting treated. You know, the ratio of, of sort of um, providers to, to students is something like one to 2,000. You know, it's something you wouldn't expect. You think, you know, people, you're paying all this money for a college and these kids are just kind of running around. It's like the, you know, Wild West kind of thing. Um, so that's, you know, that's an issue um, that, you know, obviously we're not gonna address in our little study, but it also makes it seem more important to actually, you know, uh, do something with this population. Um, and then the other rationale, uh, you know, sort of reason for focusing on this group is that there's been a fair amount of studies that show that prevention or you know early intervention kinds of methods are most effective. You get the most bang for your buck if you target people who already have some symptoms. So you could say, well, great resilience promoting things. You should do. Everybody should get that. And I and I actually do believe that. You know. Um, that's why we're sort of setting the bar so low. I mean, these people have very mild symptoms. But it's, you know, in the U.S., as you know, the, our healthcare system is not really designed for universal prevention. It's just, you know, we would have, you know, there's no funding for it, essentially. There's no will for it, unlike, say, in Australia and the U.K. and Canada, where that might be more possible. But, you know, aside from that, the research has shown that if you focus on people who have some symptoms, um, you, you get a, sort of a, a bigger effect. Um, so just to give you a flavor of the kinds of symptoms people have that, you know, are not, you know, insignificant, it turns out. You know, it turns out that quite a few kids in college who are, you know, actually functioning okay, they're enrolled, they're going to school, they're, you know, they're taking a lot of classes, um, but they still, some of them are, um, you know, experiencing uh, symptoms or having thoughts and perceptual experiences and cognitive issues that are not dissimilar to uh, people uh, who have actual major mental illness, um, supporting this continuum idea. So, for example, people uh, who we've studied and we've studied, you know, over a thousand kids at this point, um, you know, endorse persecutory beliefs, you know, something like 10%. You know some uh, you know ideas of reference. You know thinking that things are about them in the magazine or TV. Um, some t feeling that their thoughts are alien. Feeling like a rob robot or zombie. I mean you can see that the rates are about you know 10 to 15 percent in that range. Um, and and those are the kids that we're recruiting for this study. Who, you know who are sort of in that category. People endorsing some of these unusual beliefs. You know, they may not completely believe these beliefs. You know, they're just kind of thoughts that um, they might just have every once in a while because we ask them if they ever have thought this. Um, so again, very, very common to have these kind of beliefs. And the other thing that supports this continuum idea, which other people have shown, is that having these kinds of beliefs is very highly correlated with having perceptual abnormalities, experiencing mild hallucinations, which is what we see in the illness of schizophrenia. So this, again, shows that you know, these symptom clusters can exist in very mild attenuated forms in people who are actually you know, functioning normally and uh, seem uh, healthy and are not distressed or, uh, you know, seeking help. But at the same time, these kinds of beliefs are not benign and these kinds of symptoms deserve some attention. And, and we, we did a, a small analysis, but other people have shown this too. So in, in this um, analysis here, we showed that having these kinds of beliefs, especially if you have many of them, predicts 
deterioration in functioning a year later. So a year later, these, these kids who endorsed or you know, reported these kinds of beliefs had uh, some problems later. Um, and they also have some changes in the, in the brain, um, which I, I won't go into because I see I'm running out of time a little bit. Um, so in this study, we essentially screen college students for subthreshold symptoms of psychosis and depression. Um, we, uh, we include depression because depressive symptoms are, you know, it's like the common cold of psychiatry. You know, they're, they're very common, but they also increase risk for psychosis. Um, it, it's been shown in a couple of studies that 75% of initial episodes of psychosis are preceded by an episode of depression. And then we provide this four session resilience and leadership workshop, that's what we call it. Um, and we really emphasize that participants are collaborators in the development of this workshop, um, uh, that they're kind of co-creators. And they, they actually are given a certificate at the end to say that they, they were collaborators on the project. And, and that's completely real and sincere. We actually are very interested in people's opinions and feedback about what was helpful and what wasn't. Um, and in this uh, intervention, we've, we've focused on three different uh, modalities that have been established as helpful um, for a variety of conditions, both psychiatric and, well, in the case of mindfulness, also medical conditions. Um, and we've, fa we've uh, felt that they are the sort of the best modalities to, to uh, use in focusing on improving people's social cognition. And then we're, we're measuring short-term and long-term outcomes, monitoring the students over time. So I'll just quickly mention the three um, modalities that we're, we've been focused on. One is called self-compassion. And uh, I put this long quote in here. I'm not going to read it, but it's in your, your book. So um, I think the, the essence, and, and the quote is from Kristen Neth, who developed this, this method, this treatment uh, modality. And essentially, the essence of self-compassion is the idea um, that you know we tend to be very, very hard on ourselves. And some people, maybe more so than others, but people often are that way, and that creates a certain amount of you know social stress, like sort of you know stress that's coming from within, from yourself. Um, and you know it's a kind of suffering that is is avoidable if we can kind of get a, a handle on it. So. The, the main goal of self-compassion is to develop that awareness that you're kind of, uh, you know, beating yourself up to some extent, or even if it's not coming from you, if it's uh, suffering that's, uh, you know, from other things, that uh, a major way that, it, that uh, you can sort of, help, sort of reduce that stress is to, um, you know, treat yourself with understanding and concern. So the, the basic idea is, why not treat yourself the way that you would treat a friend? You know, so I, I always think of, you know, examples in my own life, like say, um, you know, this week I was very busy, I was, um, you know, kind of dealing with lots of different things, um, and I had an appointment, and as I was leaving, I couldn't find my keys, and I, you know, couldn't find my coat, and it made me late for this appointment. And you know, I was like, "Oh, that's really unprofessional." You know, how could I do that? Hard on myself. But the the trick of self compassion is to kind of pretend like the story is being told to you by a friend. Like if a friend of yours told you this story that, "Oh, the week was so stressful that I did this terrible thing and I was late for this appointment. And I couldn't." Wouldn't you say to that friend? That is so understandable, you know. You, you you're doing so many things, and how could? Of course, and and I'm sure it was fine, and you know all the things that you say to a friend. You know, we can learn to say those things to ourselves, and it's you know it's not self pity, it's not self indulgence, it's not focused on self esteem building, which is often related to sort of external, um, in external circumstances. Um, so some of the com components. I, I won't go through them in detail, but um, you know they essentially uh, have to do with being kinder to yourself, as I just mentioned, but also realizing that we we're all in this together. We're kind of very you know everybody is kind of has the same problems. We're not unique. 
Um, you know, suffering is kind of a part of life and everybody experiences it. It's not that, you know, I'm the only one that, that has this problem and, you know, there's something wrong with me and this shouldn't be happening and, and that kind of thing. That There's something very helpful to, to, you know, the brain to kind of relax and, and accept some of just this sort of day-to-day -day suffering or, you know, sort of problems that people have. And then mindfulness, which I'll talk about in a minute, is kind of an underlying essential component of, of all of these different components. Um, and um, because none of the other things are possible, none of the other skills are possible without taking the time to notice this sort of thing that, um, that hey, this is happening, this is difficult. Um, and so in, the, in this uh, uh, resilience program, uh, we conduct uh, experiential exercises that kind of teach these skills. Um, then the other main skill that we uh, teach is called mentalization, which is, you know, sort of the skill is, uh, you know, learning to uh, sort of understand one's own mental states and the mental states of others. And again, mindfulness is kind of the foundation of it. We can't really, you know, change these things if we can't observe our own mental state um, and develop a, an awareness that a thought is just a product of our own mind. Um, so one kind of classic sort of breakdown in mentalization is when you kind of develop an opinion or you know a belief about somebody else's intentions just based on some kind of physical characteristic or um, you know, just the, the behavior that you're observing without remembering that everyone has a whole bunch of things going on in their minds that could mean that there are all kinds of different reasons for somebody's behavior. And I'll try to explain that a little bit better because it's sometimes hard to understand. And in, you know, in the, this part of the program, role play is a really an important sort of tool because it's really helpful to kind of you know, essentially pretend to be another person and try and kind of uh, imagine what their mental state might be. And, you know, it's, it's really been shown in, you know, studies uh, done in, you know, other disorders, uh, um, you know, in autism, borderline personality disorder, that uh, practicing mentalization improves one's uh, ability to interact with other people and improves uh, a sense of connection to others. So this is the sort of classic test of theory of mind that can kind of help you, or mentalization theory of mind are kind of almost interchangeable uh, terms. So this is the Sally Ann test uh, where you can kind of get the essence of what theory of mind or mentalization is. So there are these two girls, Sally and Anne. Um, uh, Sally, um, you know, has a ball and she she has she puts it in her basket. Sally leaves the room, leaves Anne alone. Anne moves the ball from the basket to the box. When Sally comes back, she wants to play with the ball. Where was Sally look for her ball? So this is a test that's given to children to look for signs of sort of autism and you know that sort of theory of mind deficits, which we're, we'll hear a little bit more about later from Dr. Coleman. Um, but the idea is that you know if you understand the mental states of of you know Sally and Anne, you'll you'll understand that um, you know when Sally comes back, she's going to think that uh, the ball's in the basket because she has no idea. Uh, um, you know, what's, what's been happening. Um, and so you, you're able to kind of mentalize Sally's uh, frame of mind. Um, but, you know, people who have deficits in this capacity won't necessarily sort of get the right answer to that. So, and then this is another test that, that we often uh, uh, give people where we just ask people, uh, to infer the mental states of just of these pictures that just show the eyes of a person. So I don't know if anyone has any guesses about what um, experience this this face is depicting. That's right. Yeah. Um, and then how about this one? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I thought I heard someone say one. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, 
you know, some of these are a little bit more difficult than this, but, um, you know, the ability to think about what is this person experiencing is really what mentalization is. And then the last skill, which I won't talk about too much because I'm assuming people are familiar with mindfulness, but it, it's essentially mindfulness means paying attention in, in a particular way on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally. Uh, that's uh, John Kabat-Zinn, who's a kind of a, a big um, expert um, in mindfulness and mindfulness-based approaches um, to treating all kinds of different illnesses. Um, so the two main elements are paying attention, but also relating to the present moment in a non-judgmental, accepting way. And essentially, mindfulness is woven throughout this intervention because it's really essential for all the other uh, skills that we're uh, trying to teach. So, you know, you need to have access to the moment-to-moment -moment experience of, you know, suffering or discomfort or or whatever, uh, in order to have the opportunity to apply the skill of self-compassion. So you have to feel that, you know, feel that di sort of social discomfort or whatever kind of. Um, uh, uh, you know, painful experience or whatever before you can do something about it and learn a new way to approach it. And then the same in terms of learning mentalization skills that you need to be able to aware, be aware of your own mental states first um, before you can be sort of aware and understanding that other people have mental states. Um, and also, as you saw in the mind in the eyes test, um, you know, you need to be able to pay attention to the world, including people's facial expressions and their movements and, and things like that, in order to, um, you know, understand uh, what's going on with another person. So this is kind of the model, which I think is, is in your handout, so I won't go into it in detail. Just um, this is what we, we think that we're addressing with these different um, skills. Uh, we're trying to improve this whole kind of pathway of functioning um, with the idea that these kind of basic functions, awareness of the self and other, and also emotion regulation, cognitive flexibility, then feeds into having better social cognition if we improve those kind of fundamental skills. And then we then can improve people's sense of social connectedness, maybe increase their amount of support, and that will lead to greater resilience in the face of, of stressors. So just to quickly tell you about uh, some of our initial data, we just, we just did our first screening and workshops uh, this past year. Um, and we, um, you know, we, you can see there the, the kind of the average age and what, what's, you know, it's kind of spread evenly across freshmen, sophomore, junior, senior. Um, and most of the people in the workshop had some mild delusional thinking. The PDI is our measure of the delusional thinking. There were a few that only had mild depressive symptoms. Um, so we found that the level of depressive symptoms and delusional beliefs decreased significantly just after four sessions of this, of this, uh, in, of this workshop. We also found that levels of mindful self-compassion and psychological well-being increased significantly, particularly this thing called environmental mastery, which is a sense of kind of self-efficacy and confidence. Um, and, uh, oops, yeah, so those are just our initial results, and we, we've just almost, we're almost finished with our second round of uh, these, these workshops, and we're now expanding. We've done this in one school, and now we're expanding to a couple of other colleges in the area. Um, and so th this is a three-year study, and so this is just the first year. And so hopefully we'll have some very solid data to show you um, in a few years um, about whether this had effects both immediately. So these are effects that we see immediately after the workshop. But more importantly, what are the effects you know, over the coming years for these students? Um, so some extensions of this project. We are also doing some similar kinds of uh, work in uh, a middle school and in a high school after school program. We also have a program for siblings of people with schizophrenia with the idea that, you know, people, family members of, of, of people with psychotic illness, you know, need support. You know, they're, they're you know, one at a, a, some, some small degree of risk for the illness themselves, but also they're dealing with this, you know, sort of a stressful situation. Um, 
And you know, so it's part support group, but also part you know, learning some of these skills. Um, and then we, in development is a program for individuals with um, active illness, which um, of course is very important too. And, and all of these things that I've said apply to people at all stages of the illness. Um, so I just want to thank the team that, that has um, really put this together. Um, you know, this, this was a really a, like a major team effort. Uh, there's Annie Burke, who's here today, um, and Corey Kather, who I think will be here later, and, um, and Mara Nair, and also Ben Shapiro, Lo Logan uh, Lethem, um, Andrea Bal Baldelli, and, uh, and, um, and Leah Namey. And then uh, my lab, who also was very crucial in, in doing a lot of this work. And then I want to thank George Handron and the Sydney Bear Foundation, um, who has supported this project. Thank you. And, sorry to just, just over.